So, hello and welcome. Here we are in lecture six. And today we'll be talking about encapsulation. And this is us kind of rounding out the uh, collection of stuff where after today, that is after two weeks of lectures in this course, you should be able to do most things you can do in Verilog in Chisel. Now, maybe a handful of things you won't be able to do uh, in Chisel you can do in Verilog, but there's also a handful of things you've already learned how to do in Chisel you, you can't do in Verilog. And then from here going forwards, uh, you'll be continuing to learn just more and more parameterization, more and more ways to build generators and more flexible hardware. So uh, let's go on to that. So like I said, today we're talking particular about encapsulating things. So, so far we've kind of building very simple modules, but as you start to want to get bigger, uh, we're going to need to build bigger things. And, you know, simply having a single module do everything is going to become eventually untenable, right? So we want to have ways to kind of col uh, collapse our hardware into kind of nice bite-sized pieces. So that way we can kind of reuse things and move them between different parts and have kind of sane scopes to deal with. Uh, additionally, encapsulation is also a way for us to hide complexity, right? Where, you know, ideally we'll build a generator someday that users can read the API rather than the code and understand how it works. And they only need to understand the interfaces and the parameters and all details how it works underneath the hood is something we're going to try, you know, encapsulate and hide inside of our implementation. Uh, in particular, we're doing a few things to incorporate this kind of stuff today. We'll be talking about how to use Scala features, things like we can kind of dancing around but now take head on, such as, you know, declaring functions and, you know, actually doing objects and using objects as well. Uh, on the chisel side, we'll be talking a little bit about some things uh, such as bundles where you can kind of put these all together. Okay, uh, make sure I didn't miss anything. Great. Uh, so uh, let's go ahead and load in as per usual. Um, and let's go from there. So uh, you may have already kind of been able to intuit uh, the function syntax in Scala for uh, setting up a method. Uh, in particular, uh, what you do is you uh, will typically, like you see on the right here, you'll usually use def, function name, and then parentheses, and then the argument list. Um, and so uh, these are really trivial functions. So we just said equals, and we don't even need to have any braces. But with multiple lines, you are going to need braces. And now, one interesting thing to recognize about functions in Scala is that they return the last line, right? So uh, maybe here it's very clear what's going on, but if you make this multi-line using the braces, uh, that's what's going on, right? So you can see that in this case, you know, given a number, this plus one function, of course, going to simply add one to it, and what's returning is the result of adding those, right? So I could have arbitrary computations above this, and then the last lines will get returns. And remember, this is kind of like we saw with the if statements earlier, right? Where the if statements, not just the control structure, but it's also something that returns something, right? So here's a function that does the same thing, right? Now, normally, you know, if you follow in regular Scala, you have to kind of put your functions inside of either a class or an object. Uh, however, you know, with this, you know, nice world we've created inside Jupyter, we're able to kind of, in particular using Almond, the scripting language, we're able to kind of break that rule. But normally, if you wanted to find a function in Scala, it needs to be inside of a, a class or object scope. Uh, some other little details. Uh, you know, these arguments, much like the class parameters we saw before, they need to be, uh, they're treated by default as val. So if you want to make them a var, you need to declare it a var. So for example, if I tried to, you know, say n equals, you know, n plus one, it's going to yell at me. If I said I want to make that a var, it's going to be okay with that. Oops. Sometimes it's okay with that. Um, but it's not going to be okay, right? So you have to, uh, well, there's a reassignment to val. Yes, uh, don't do that. <laughs> That's kind of a short answer. If, you, if, if I seem puzzled about using var, it's because I managed to get through writing Scala for you know almost 11 years now and use var less than half a percent of the time, if even. Um, and so <laughs> uh, that, that, that's part of what's going on. Uh, OK, uh, so we talked about that. Uh, one more thing you see down here is you can also have a default value, right? So for trailing arguments, you can assign a default value. And that way, I can say, you know, give it two arguments or one. So it's kind of a lightweight way to do overloading. Right, uh, you know, of course, I can you know make this behave a little differently, uh, but that's not it's not too crazy, right? So this is you know perhaps not a super crazy syntax, uh, and it's kind of nice. I, I, I think this is really kind of a pretty simple little syntax. I like this a lot um, compared to other languages I've dealt with. Uh, it's pretty pretty smooth. Okay, so let's keep going. Um, so naturally, once we have functions, we want to perhaps call them recursively, right? And so, of course, you're familiar with recursion from some other languages you've learned taking prior to this course. Uh, the only interesting wrinkle about recursion in Scala is now you're required to specify the return type. So remember before when you declared uh, vowels, like in the prior slide, 
we just kind of, for the most part, did it. We did the kind of the, the label of types on our arguments, but otherwise, we don't really label types very often, and things kind of work out. Uh, when it comes to uh, recursion, we're required to give a return type. So you know, so this is like a function, and you know, using the syntax, there's colon and then a return type. And then here we have a multi-line function, so we're using the braces. And yeah, okay, so you know, like usual in doing uh, recursion, you should probably think about your base case and make sure it doesn't keep going on forever. Uh, and remember, this the last line is what we return, right? So here we're using this if, we're either returning a zero uh, or this else, right? So this is simply just summing up the numbers uh, from zero to n. That's what this little uh, thing does. And you can see, of course, it gets 10, right? Because, you know, from zero plus one plus two plus three, that's, you know, one, three, six, and then plus four is 10. Yeah, that works out. Um, and, you know, uh, not only is recursion a nice kind of way to kind of replace re iteration like things, but sometimes it's kind of easy way to think about a problem. So, for example, you know, here's a classic, you know, recursive uh, implementation uh, for Fibonacci. Uh, and yes, that works kind of as we expect. So let's kind of go through this, right? We know uh, we're going to call, maybe I'll first uh, just call it on a single thing, right? So what's it doing, right? So it's going to call um, fib on five, right? And fib comes in, okay, it's greater than two. Uh, so it's going to uh, fail this if statement and then recurse, right? So as you probably studied in prior courses, you know, doing Fibonacci in this way, although it gets you the correct answer, you know, it's perhaps not as efficient as we would like. Um, however, uh, there's a few things to point out, right? Uh, number one, uh, you know, correctness does trump efficiency. So if somehow decomposing your problem to something that's, you know, recursion-based, that perhaps isn't optimal, but it's easy to reason about, uh, that's still probably a win. Uh, number two, uh, it's, it's for a lot of the things we're doing in hardware, the number of iterative function calls may not be that high. So sometimes we can get away with, you know, what might seem like a less efficient iteration space only because, uh, you know, the number of iterations is small. Um, but it, it's good to have efficient code when you can, of course. Uh, but anyway, so we kind of, you know, have uh, shown a brief uh, demo. Uh, one thing you may have seen before, we'll kind of say again, uh, if you ever need to have an empty return type, be required to have one, uh, unit is the word you're looking for, right? Um, and we've seen unit before, right? If I uh, am trying to, um, you know, find out what do I get, you know, for example, if I say like uh, val x equals, you know, print line of uh, hello, this should also be unit, right? So it's gonna print that out, but then I should say what is x and x is gonna be uh, unit. Is that not cut off? Oops, that might be cut off. Um, but the type of, actually, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm yeah, void, right? It's, it's a unit. Okay, so <laughs> there we go. Cool. Uh, okay, so now we can do recursive uh, functions or, or uh, methods in Scala. You may hear me use the word function instead of method. Uh, I believe in Scala for most cases, is the proper term actually is method, but, uh, you know, old, old, old habits die hard. Uh, okay, so let's, let's keep going. Um, so you can, you, of course, you're saying the same story over and over again, right? Is that chisel components are just Scala objects. So we can go ahead and build them out however we can for a program. And so like I said, the goal of this whole process, we want to try and hide that complexity, we want to encapsulate it. Uh, and what's nice about having high, nice modular components is that, you know, of course we can declare something once and use it in many places. Uh, and also we'll see how ways you do things like using recursion to kind of not only perform iteration, but to kind of break our big problem down to much more smaller and more manageable problems, right? It's kind of divide and conquer style. And uh, although what we've seen so far, we're kind of constantly putting things into a module, that's more of a byproduct of um, what we need to do in order to complete, uh, you know, uh, testing and such, where we have to kind of put things in module. There's no reason why you can't make functions that just return snippets of chisel, you know, returns a uint, returns a reg or something. Uh, that's totally fine. Um, and put those together, right? So you kind of in mind almost start imagining uh, the Scala code, which is, you know, calling functions or doing whatever it's doing, that kind of, you know, is going to go away and you kind of think of what's the resulting operations called on chisel components to kind of start seeing what your hardware is going to do. Um, and then we, we have seen things like module and bundle. Uh, and those are, you know, classes defined by chisel that we often extend. And those kind of bring additional things into the scope, so to speak, and handle additional stuff. But Chisel components can often exist outside of those. It's just certain things towards the end. We kind of need those to have them around. Okay. So, uh, 
remember from a couple lectures ago, we talked about, uh, actually last lecture, sorry, but I called this delay end block. Really, other people might call this a shift register, right? We have these registers kind of in a row. So here's the prior implementation, right, where we had an input, some number of cycles we wanted to delay, and that's how many registers we're going to make. And so, well, what are we doing? We showed a few different implementations in the last lecture, but we said this one perhaps with a var and a for loop kind of seemed kind of nice. And one of the things we liked about this one was not only could it do it correctly uh, for, you know, uh, n greater than zero, but uh, so we can see here, of course, there's uh, two regs uh, being defined and it's kind of, you know, connecting them over like this. Um, we could also make this, you know, for example, zero, and it gracefully, uh, you know, turns into a pass-through component of no uh, registers blocking the middle. So that was kind of cool. Um, so we can go ahead and replace our uh, for loop for var with a uh, recursive function, right? So here we define a little helper function. And what does it take? Well, it takes how many more times to call itself and the last connection. And you can see the internals look a lot similar, right? Where we you know, have our base case where if we ever get down to n equals zero, we just pass our input to our output. Otherwise, we're going to go ahead and put a register onto that, uh, that input, right? And then we kind of you know we're reducing our iteration count. And we connect this through. And so this is going to produce uh, you know, analogous hardware. Uh, I mean, it's a little hard with all the extra junk, but it's basically the same. Uh, and of course, you know, once again, if we also want to simplify it, that works as well. So here's an example of why am I so bad with using var? Uh, don't need to, right? <laughs> uh, this recursive function does it just fine. Now, if you were to, you know, use a stopwatch in practice, if you really want to, you know, do a lot of iterations, uh, calling your function recursively is probably not the most efficient thing in the world, even with tail recursion. Uh, there's a way in Scala to actually even annotate tail recursion. Um, in spite of that, like I said, those kind of performance details, for the most part, for the kind of things we're doing, these hard design things, don't come up, right? It's more important to get it right, get it clear, get it correct. Um, and uh, we'll worry about, you know, oh my gosh, let's put the fastest thing possible. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I encourage you and invite you to um, try to kind of embrace this through kind of your know, recursive mindset to get things kind of nice and correct. Uh, one, one expression is often uttered, which I don't always... Uh, not that I disagree with, I don't always believe it's possible or easy, is something called correct by construction. So this is kind of that mentality of, you know, well, I'll, I'll break it down to really simple things, and if they're all correct, and they can put them all together correct, then it's correct by construction. But uh, sometimes it's easier said than done. But here's an example of that. So maybe I've been talking a lot so far, so I'll pause for a second if there's any questions so far, uh, as we kind of gone through with this brief crash course into using functions in Scala, and then recursive functions, and then using recursive functions to build up our chisel components. Yeah, so the, I just going to repeat this for the recording. So there's a question about, you know, could talk a little bit more about this Verilog. So yeah, so Verilog, remember, it's kind of annoying where you have this keyword reg, which doesn't actually guarantee the creation of register. It's more if you use a reg in just the right way, the CAD tools will infer a register. So in particular, the canonical way is you declare a reg, and then you put it inside an always block, and then you use a uh, non-blocking assignment. Those are kind of the key... <laughs> Uh, ingredients to get a register inferred by Verilog tools. Um, you can use reg for things that are purely combinational and will turn into purely combinational logic. So that's why it's kind of annoying where that name reg, you know, it's so close to register, but it's not guaranteed to be registered. as <laughs> one of those wrinkles of Verilog. This is the question was, okay, wait a second, let's talk about this helper function's return type. So it's bool, uh, you know, if I don't make it bool, it's not gonna be able to, uh, you know, exist as a, return, as a recursive function that needs that return type. So how does this kind of integrate in here? Well, its input is a bool, right? Uh, and so you can, you can kind of see how that kind of originated, right? So our bool is what we're using the type for here. This could have been just as well, could have been a uint or something. Uh, and uh, so what do we do? Well, we initially called it, we passed in the first input, right? And then um, uh, when you call reg next, or should make it clear, more clear over here, right? The output of reg next is a um, 
is a bool, right? It's the output of that register, right? So perhaps maybe make this more clear. I can go ahead and annotate this one over here. And that's not going to cause any errors because so I, you know, I'm correctly annotating the type. So last con here is a bool. Basically, I'm pointing something that said chisel bool. So yeah, you know, our input's a bool, great. And then as I continue to go through the output of these each registers, because the register is declared as type bool, and how do we know the register is declared type bool? Well, it's inferred from uh, the input, right? So the input was a type bool, so it's okay. If your input's a type bool, then your output's gonna be type bool for a register. So that's kind of what's happening. So there's a little bit of inference going on both by chisel and by skull, so maybe it's good to kind of make them more verbose. It's good to ask this question. Um, yeah, so we had a bool input to the register, so the register, you know, inferred a bool output type. That's what's returned by this regnext helper function. Uh, we'll actually learn about these kind of functions later today. These are actually, um, people might uh, call these factory methods. Because uh, you realize we instantiated a register, we didn't call the word new. And so we'll come to that in just a, a moment. Um, and uh, so, okay, so the return of this factory method is uh, a bool point to the output of the uh, register. And that's what we put here, and then we can pass that on to the next one. Um, and so on the right, that's kind of what's happening. Is we're doing the same thing, right? You know, we're getting the output, which is a bool. And we're passing it on through the recursion to the next call to regnex, which is going to use that as input, right? So we're still kind of having the same effective pattern. We're just doing it um, with recursion rather than a for loop. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I can understand at times perhaps, you know, a lot of us are perhaps more familiar with for loops. It seems like a more natural way to write things. Uh, number one, get it right. So this is the way to make sense to you. Uh, get, get it right. Um, but uh, I encourage you to try it out. Like I said, sometimes there'll be some situations where it won't be such a linear, simple iteration space, in which case having this recursion is kind of a nicer way to kind of decompose the problem. Uh, and so yeah, I encourage, and so this is just kind of a trivial example to kind of fit, you know, compactly in one of these slides. But great questions. I'm gonna pause for any more. Cool, okay, uh, we're gonna keep going. Yeah, so um, now we're you know, already, uh, we're using Scala functions to build up chisel components, right? And they're recursive, right? So we're already, whew, that was zero to 60 pretty quick today's lecture. Um, let's, oops, let's keep going. Uh, sorry, get out of that cell and then we advance it. Yeah. Okay. So you may have heard me use the terms classes and objects kind of indistinguishably, uh, interchangeably, you know, and in terms of Scala, they're a little bit more nuanced. Uh, so most of what we've seen so far is a class, right? So class is kind of like defining a type and you can have instances of a class. Uh, and so the correct word is instances. I often perhaps maybe might remember you say the word object, but no, the correct word is an instance of a class. In contrast, an object in Scala is something that's a singleton, meaning there's exactly one of them. So when your program starts, you don't even need to ask for it. If you declare something an object, it exists, right? It's a singleton object. Um, and, uh, you know, by contrast, a class, you need to instantiate an instance, right? Say I need new class or whatever. Um, and so why do we have this singleton object in Scala? A few reasons, right? Sometimes it's kind of helpful to have things that, you know, aren't encapsulated in a class. And so in languages like C, for example, you just kind of have things floating around. You want to have constants floating out there. You want to have other things. No problem. In Scala, outside this notebook environment, you have to have everything inside of either a class or an object, right? So you want to have kind of shared things, put those in an object. Um, those shared things can be either constants uh, or mutable things. Uh, you know, you can have stateless functions. Maybe you want a function that's something you just call this function it doesn't necessarily need to be associated to an instance of an object. Put that in an object. Uh, sorry, to an instance of a class, sorry. Put that stateless function into an object, right? Uh, or something we're gonna see right here, something called a factory method. Now, uh, this is something I think was a learning curve for a lot of us, myself included in learning about Scala, is you know, saying, oh, I've learned object-oriented programming, great. And then this language assumes something called the factory pattern, which may not be a household name for all of us. Uh, and what that pattern is, is basically having a different object construct an instance of the class you want, right? And the reason why this is nice sometimes is that object can do some things to uh, kind of do some housekeeping for you. So sometimes it's pretty trivial, uh, like kind of like we have here, it's kind of like a little bit like function overloading or constructor overloading. But other times it's very much very non-trivial. And it's kind of to have this kind of separation of concerns of this is a class which has, you know, certain data inside of it and perhaps methods that operates on it. And there's something else which understands how to create that. So it's kind of this factory method pattern. Um, Okay, so let's go see this example. So on the right here, we know we define 
a simple little class. Uh, it has, you know, a couple arguments. And remember, these arguments are accessible internally. Uh, and so we define this, uh, you know, function inside of our method, you know, sum, which of course adds them together. Um, so we'll go ahead and comment these out, and let's go ahead and run this, right? So, uh, yeah, you know, we defined a class. We can instantiate it to use the new keyword. Um, and, you know, we can call uh, these methods on an instance of the class, right? I can't say, you know, um, you know my pair dot sum because, you know, that's not going to work, right? You need to actually instantiate it. Now, uh, if I did this, you might think, oh, that might work. No, actually, I need to make an instance, right? So you need that new keyword to make an instance. And then on that instance, sure, you can go ahead and run uh, the sum method on that instance. Now, this particular way of writing it, uh, you know, I didn't name an instance. I just made it. <laughs> it's anonymous and then I called a function on it, but I never really had a way to get back to it, right? This val is this reference. Let's just get back to that uh, that reference, uh, that, 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 that object. Sorry, that instance we built. Um, and as we said before, uh, in Scala, you don't have to put the parens on arguments uh, as a style point. It's actually, uh, you're encouraged to uh, omit the parentheses if there are no arguments and the method does not mutate internal state. So if this is a, you know, const kind of method, doesn't change anything, and there's no arguments, you're actually encouraged to not put the parens on it. Because it makes it kind of seem more like a field, right? And this, even though in this case, it's technically a, fun, uh, a method rather than, a, you know, a field inside that class, because you're not changing anything by reading it, people seem to think that syntax is kind of simpler. So you may have seen, you know, some of the collections, you may have seen like, oh, well, it's like, you know, on my seek instance, I might have said, you know, something like seek dot, you know, is empty, right? Because that looks like a, one of these methods, right? Okay, and then here we have our, our companion object, right? So what makes the companion object? So you can have a class, you can have an object, they can have different names. If a class and the object have the same name, the object's referred to as a companion object. And depending on the way you use it, the language understands which one you're referring to. So, for example, we define an object which, you know, this is, you know, one singleton object, one for, you know, all time, uh, has this var, which when the program first starts, it can be initialized to zero. Um, and then, uh, you know, so of course I can go ahead and read that. Uh, and what's interesting is inside this um, object, we're going to use this factory method pattern. So we're going to call apply, for example. And then with that, uh, we can, you know, collect arguments and then call, uh, you know, the constructor or sort of make a new instance of class and we're returning this, right? So what is this apply method doing? It's returning an instance of the class, right? So it's, it's that factory method kind of at work, right? Uh, apply is a special keyword in Scala. So when you call the object name with parens without anything other, you know, keywords, that's going to invoke the apply. So this is going to invoke the uh, apply thing. So Maybe the first time around, I'll go ahead and, you know, um, give it two arguments. And so what does it do? Well, uh, it's going to, you know, make that my pair object. We can call sums. Also worth noting that, you know, as a side effect, this is, you know, a liberal mutable thing we did here. Uh, every time we create uh, a pair, we're going to keep track of that. We're going to count how many these exist, right? So initially, when the program started, there were zero of them. And then... Um, I made one, and so then I call that thing again, and now it says there's one. Now you may be wondering, wait a second, uh, didn't we make a pair beforehand, right? What about this NPC one? We did, right? And we can see what happened here is, of course, we, you know, inadvertently, uh, you know, sidestepped our accounting by instantiating the class directly rather than through this companion uh, factory method, right? And so. Um, when you design your, your classes and your objects and your interfaces, you should definitely be very clear how you expect users to interact with things. Uh, if you have a companion object, you usually kind of want people to kind of go through there rather than directly into the class because you may be kind of controlling additional states or setting things up. Additionally, for example, uh, it was easy for us to overload things, right? So in this case, we're able to say, uh, you know, hey, I want to have maybe uh, a way to construct it with fewer arguments. And we went ahead and filled it in with a uh, other thing, right? So. Uh, that's also going to work. Uh, you know, of course, we get a sum of three. But uh, there you have it. So uh, this is a lot to digest all at once, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, but the reason why I went through this is you're going you're gonna to see uh, this object kind of appear quite a bit in the remaining uh, lectures in this course. And typically, we're going to have an object where we're going to put things like, uh, you know, const we'll have for our project, kind of be able to everything. Uh, or maybe we're going to go ahead and define um, a stateless helper function 
chuck that into an object. Maybe you're going to want to define an enum, uh, you know, to hold uh, certain state names or things you use for things. Easiest way to share around those kind of consts and enums is through an object, actually, um, and that sort of stuff, right? And so that's going to kind of help out with that. Um, Great. Uh, okay, so I think there's anything else I want to mention about objects. Maybe I'll pause again for questions. It's definitely a pretty, pretty dense slide. <laughs> so apply is called when you use the object name followed by parens with no method name. So apply is a keyword. So it's kind of a question of we're trying to we're trying to describe you know what happens when you call you know my pair with just parens. And that's going to uh, invoke apply. So that's a great question, right? So my pair uh, with parens calls apply on the object. This also is my pair with parens, but it's new my pair, so it calls the class. Um, now there's one little feature we're not using here, but if you look it up, you can check it out. There's actually also a keyword dis for within the class and um, if you use it as a function you overload, you actually can make an overload constructor directly within the class. Although that's possible, I sh recommend stylistically to do any uh, constructor overloading in the companion object. And that way it's kind of more clear with kind of see what's going on. That way you have your, your class instances, which is very clear, you know, here's the data I need to do what I need to do. And here's how I operate on it. And then the, make the companion object worry about how to best kind of put things together, construct it. Um, it's kind of a good style point. It kind of separates the two things. Sometimes people get so involved, um, that's like what's together. And so, yeah, so I have a great uh, reminder from the uh, TA. I'm appreciative of this. So uh, apply uh, can be used a lot of places other than just companion objects, right? So apply just means, like I said, this is Scala's way of saying I want to overload uh, whatever thing I'm inside of uh, and then parents, right? So for example, if I was making a collection, uh, like, like an array, and I want to have, you know, someone indexing into me, you can imagine they've overridden the apply function such that that way they return um, uh, I don't think, you know, you, you, you can say, you know, array.x, sorry, array.get something, or you can just say array parens and index and it works. And the way it's doing that is with the supply function. So you can, you can override a supply function. Um, right now it's really easy to do. Uh, depending on how you set your class hierarchy, which we'll cover more later, uh, you can use certain keywords to make things harder, easier to extend and that sort of stuff. Uh, so yeah, I, to be honest, I'm not sure I can answer that correctly. So, uh, what, what I would say, uh, sorry, sorry, to clarify the question is, is, is apply inherited from some sort of, you know, uh, parent object somewhere? Uh, it definitely gets passed on when you inherit things. Uh, in the case of this particular object, which I didn't give, uh, any, uh, inheritance to, where does that apply come from? Is there one I'm overriding or is this from scratch? I believe it's from scratch. Um. As I mentioned, depending on the nature of your class is that, you know, right now these are just classes. If you have like an abstract class or if you have other things like that, and there's, there's a bunch of keywords in, in Java that kind of have similar but different meanings in Scala. Uh, I'm not going to go super far in that kind of stuff for now. We'll come back to that in a few weeks. <laughs> but for now, yeah, you know, uh, you can build a class with some instances, no problem. And if you want to have this companion object, like I said, it's good to hand, kind of share, put shared things into as well as to declare these uh, factory methods to kind of uh, declare things. Oh, so, so yes, so, so the question is basically saying, wait a second, why do I have, you know, two applies? Would this work fine with just one? Yes, it would, right? Uh, so this will work just fine with one apply, right? The second apply is me deciding to overload this function, right? So I said, hey, what if somebody wants to declare something uh, with only one argument, right? Now, pragmatically, right, we know we can um, uh, do this, right? And we'll have the same behavior, right? Uh, however, um, even though you could use a default value, uh, I didn't, uh, just to kind of show the benefit of having a, another constructor. And what's kind of about this particular pattern 
of setting things up is that uh, this constructor calls another constructor, right? So we have, you know, even though there's different ways of getting into the uh, object, because we're kind of following the same code path and there's you know, less code duplication, hopefully less chance for an error, right? It's kind of the goal. Um, and now you have me curious, what happens if I leave this in here? Is it going to yell at me? Nope. <laughs> but I'm really curious which one it's running. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure, to be honest, but there's some sort of resolution rules for that. Um, that's probably, if you, have, if, if you have ambiguity about which one it's calling, it's probably a sign to me to rethink your uh, type signatures. Uh, yeah, there's also another uh, endorsement from the chat from one of the students saying companion objects are pretty special. Scala uses them for a lot of things. Yeah, they're, they're, they're pretty special is a good answer. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we, we, we've been using them not realizing it, right? So now we've seen this slide, we understand that every time we're getting some sort of uh, what we think is an instance of something and we're not using the keyword new, we're probably calling something on a companion object, right? So all those things we saw reg before, like reg, reg next, reg in it, those are all companion objects for a reg. We didn't say new reg, right? Um, so that's kind of what's going on. Cool. Uh, let's keep going. Oops. Should be able to advance. There we go. All right. So uh, kind of taking what we just learned and putting some practice for uh, for chisel, right? So we had this counter in our uh, first lecture uh, this week on uh, using state. It's the same code, just copied again. And uh, this counter is unmodified, but we just wrapped it in the companion object, right? So what's the uh, consequence? Uh, the consequence is before we, you know, uh, say, hey, I want a new counter. Okay. Uh, now that I define a companion object, I can, you know, remove the new, right? Um, Removing a new isn't the only reason why you build a companion object, but for the simple example of taking full advantage of the object, uh, it will um, it will work. Cool. So that's this you know an example of this uh, working. So I said this is a second ago, right? You know things like mocks and these other things, those are actually being called on objects, right? And they may under the hood be using uh, instances of classes, but that's kind of what we're seeing. Um, okay, so uh, we can take one step further, right? So we've been encapsulating things. We've been talking about, oh, so nice to kind of things encapsulated and contained. Uh, but as I said before, a chisel module just kind of brings certain things in a scope. You don't necessarily need a module, right? So um, in particular, what happens if I just um, make a, a counter but I don't extend module. So notice there's no IO, right? Uh, so what am I doing here? Well, I'm taking in a parameter, you know, we're using that for our maximum value. We're taking in a bool. Remember, bool is that chisel, chisel type. So we're taking in an enable signal. And, you know, we go ahead and declare our register for our count like before. We still do our when statement just like before. So it's a perfectly valid chisel. And you notice we have, you know, if it's enabled, we're going to go ahead and uh, increment potentially if we're Less than max, we add one. If we're at the max, uh, you know, we reset that zero. And so uh, after all this, we've created an instance of uh, this thing, right? Now, here I have my companion object, my counter. You know, same name, so it's a companion object. We have our apply function. So take in those two arguments. And what do we do with those? We use those to not only make an instance of my counter, if we gave someone an instance of my counter, that actually might not be as helpful as they might think, because they have this kind of this, you know, Scala instance, but they want to, what they really care about is kind of what's inside of it, right? And so in particular, what they want perhaps is the output. So we go ahead and the last line of reply method is what we're actually returning, and we're returning uh, this field of this instance, and that's what's going to be the count, right? Um, so this should, you know, all uh, compile out. Great. And um, if you go ahead and look at instantiating this, in order for the sake of writing Verilog, we need to put it inside a module, because otherwise, you know, what's it inside of? Uh, we can go ahead and instantiate that. And yeah, we can have our enable and our count. Uh, so we make an instance of this, and then we attach it to, um, to count. Uh, and there we have it. 
Uh, you know, it's the same counter from before. I can probably even cut out this line. Just fine, yeah. So great. Um, and so it's inter let's, let's kind of pause to be sure we've done it for a moment, right? So we've used Scala's, you know, class mechanisms to uh, compartmentalize and encapsulate some amount of chisel functionality, but it's not necessarily in a module, right? Uh, we put in a module and instantiate it on the right side, but on the left side, at this point, when someone calls, you know, my countering it when it gets what they return from it, they're only getting, uh, you know, uh, just this collection of chisel things, right? And uh, this actually is very helpful at times, where uh, when it comes to composing things together, you know, modules are a little bit rigid, right? Because modules need you to have things with an I.O. You need to connect both sides of the I.O.s. I.O.s are kind of like wires, right? And you connect one side and the other side. And uh, modules also appear as modules in the Verilog. Now, when you declare things like this, where you kind of have this kind of floating, you know, thing, uh, it's basically effectively inlined wherever it's instantiated. And sometimes that leads to, you know, um, more concise uh, implementations downstream in the tool flows. In terms of actual hardware, whether I put everything in a module all the time versus sometimes having these, you know, modulus uh, classes, uh, it should be the same, right? Any decent cat tool should recognize, oh, wait, these are just wires connected through to each other. It can understand what's happening. It can figure out what's connected to what. It'll be fine. But in terms of us kind of reasoning about things and making sense of things, uh, we kind of use modules a little bit more deliberately about kind of thinking this is something we kind of want to have as a clear boundary, have clear IOs on. But there may be things inside of that module that we may want to be more clever with and more flashy with. And one thing we'll see uh, more next week is for these uh, classes that are modulus that aren't actually modules, part of the advantage of doing them isn't just the fact you can inline them. We can actually also define methods on these classes that make them more feel kind of like a programming object, less like a, less like a module, right? So uh, if that sounds confusing, maybe more clear to cover that next week. <laughs> But for now, that's kind of the point. We're able to kind of start playing around with stuff. So like I said, the chisel objects are kind of building in our programs. These are really kind of more of like a side effect for programmers. Right? And the Scala program shows what it does. And along the way, it's constructing this graph of uh, chisel components, which gets turned into a circuit by the tool flow. And so uh, here's yet another example of that. We're here, we're kind of, you know, swimming in the deep end, so to speak, where we are making chisel components without putting them in a module. And, you know, we're able to return and do just fine. And then... Yes, it tosses the module to print it out, but you, you can do that for a while. Cool. Okay, uh, I think we can continue if there's no more questions. So we just did all these examples of a counter. Uh, and what's the punchline? The punchline is, don't worry, uh, Chisel has one built in. So it's technically inside chisel.chisel3.util. Um, and uh, I just wanted to, you know, these examples of the counters are very simple component to understand. Uh, and so their counter actually follows the structure I just described, right? Where when you use their counter, you don't say new counter, right? You just say counter. It takes an enable and number to count up to. Now what's interesting is they actually return not one thing, not the count, not just the count, but two things. Uh, and so this is the tuple syntax in Scala where you can have tuples and you can return a tuple, you can assign a tuple like this. You may see this in Python. Um, and so what's interesting is it returns not only the current count, but also a bool if it has, you know, um, reached a target value. So, uh, you know, here's uh, their uh, implementation of it. We can go ahead and get the Verilog, and perhaps it won't look too different from what we were expecting before. You know, we can see, okay, well, it's going to wrap when we, uh, we're going to add, keep adding one to it. Uh, we're going to wrap when it reaches that max value of three because we wanted to build a counter that goes, counts four things, right? So you count four things to go from zero to three. Um, and you can see inside of there, right? Of course, on reset, it goes to zero. And then if it's enables, you take this wrap value T1, wrap value T1 uh, is this. And they actually don't even bother worrying about the, the mux like we did. They kind of take advantage of the actual wrap around. But I think if this was not able to wrap around, it's probably going to be more smart. And then we can see it actually uh, recognizing the need to uh, reset itself automatically. So you can see, once again, this is kind of nicely designed uh, internals inside this util library where our version, you know, always kind of did that wrap check versus theirs recognized, oh wait, just by, you know, natural, uh, you know, binary from tickets and wrap around anyways. So I don't need to do anything special. So it kind of took that out. Um, this is an example, you kind of get more sophisticated if you're generators. 
Now, another neat little nice thing they've added recently to the counter uh, module or a counter, you know, generator uh, is you actually can use the Scala range syntax. So rather than just saying I want to count five things, you can say, here's a range. And so, for example, if I want to do zero uh, until seven, um, and at this point, the argument doesn't really matter to the other thing, that's just fine, right? And you can see, for example, yeah, I said by two. So it's actually counting uh, by two. Um, and so, yeah, so I give this kind of an example of here's a you know, built-in generator in the util library. And you kind of, basically we've covered so far, I can already kind of understand the things that go into this, right? Um, and so that's kind of pretty cool. And you can imagine counters, of course, are extremely helpful components in designs where you constantly want to have, you know, something doing something uh, where it takes some number of cycles and rather than having like a discrete state and a fine state machine, like a switch statement for every single possible option, you often use, you know, counters to kind of count, pass it to the time to kind of reset your counters and stuff like that. And there's, there's more flavors of counter linked uh, on these uh, pieces here. Cool. Um, maybe we'll go ahead and revert that. Alrighty, and then we keep going. Uh, if there's no questions, uh, okay. So let's talk about bundle. So bundle is the way in Chisel we kind of put things together. It's a uh, aggregate type that has named fields, much like a struct in other languages. Um, we've learned about vex, which is another aggregate thing, but it's indexed numerically. Um, and so, so far we've seen bundle just to make uh, IO interfaces, right? But that's actually not the only place they're going to be used. Uh, and what's kind of nice about this bundle is, you know, rather than having to kind of write out all these fields every time you declare a module, you can kind of declare it once and use it in many places. And you'll see later on, you're also going to declare a bundle, a bundle, and then use that within another bundle to kind of construct things up hierarchically, right? Um, so it's pretty cool. So for our first step, let's just imagine we're doing some sort of uh, numbering system. So we're having a magnitude. It has a field X, sure, it's a uint. Um, here's a custom bundle class, and so that's no problem. We go ahead and then instantiate it, and we can assign this, and so it's just gonna be a, you know, a, path, a simple output. Not too fancy, or but you know, cool. What's nice now is I've defined this uh, bundle type, and so I can use this mag anywhere else I want to talk to this thing. Uh, so now if we see in the coming slides, we can go ahead and start kind of you know augmenting that. Um, so how can we augment it? We can augment it in a few different dimensions. So one dimension uh, is with inheritance, right? We can extend it. So uh, the mag type has only one field x for like the number. Uh, the sign and mag type, now we've added on a field for sign, right? So we will take the unsigned one and just add another field on for sign, for example. Um, this is some boilerplate. I'm going to come down a couple slides. So just for now, you know, cover your eyes. Um, all right, so that's cool. So you can you, you can instantiate a bundle, you can extend it. We'll cover inheritance in more detail later on, but this is kind of just a day one inheritance. Uh, and then what else can you do with it? Well, you also can instantiate other bundles within a bundle. And you can even put them inside of a vec, right? No problem. So that's what we did here, right? So here we decided, okay, well, we defined a number. We add another field to it. So there's X and S inside this thing. We can maybe make a pair of them put it by putting those two of those in the vec. And so what do we have? Okay, we go ahead and instantiate our you know, new um, uh, bundle. And if we look at the fields, right, you can see, okay, well, uh, you know, pair sign mag has a field called nums. Uh, nums is a vec, and we you know, index in the vex with the round parens, okay. And so we said it has two, so zero and one are both valid. And then uh, each of those are sign mag, which uh, it has uh, an S and X field. So Okay, those are the four fields, and of course we can run this code in a second to get the Verilog. A uh, few things to note here, right? So uh, obviously it's kind of cool to have this extension and you know nesting and composition that kind of stuff. Um, but oops, we just lost uh, one of the cameras. Let me try and fix that real quick. Uh, see if this fixes it. Uh, yes, it does. Okay, that was a great hacky fix. Um, so, uh, yeah, so you can see, okay, um, it's kind of fun to nest things or to extend things. Uh, but in terms of readability here, let's pause for a moment, right? If I'm only looking at the code at the point of, you know, here, and I'm trying to find where all these fields come from, the fact these fields came from three different code blocks, 
perhaps not the best for readability. Um, so my own personal advice on this is, you know, uh, obviously there's great times when you can reuse things. And so when you can reuse things, that's a good time to kind of separate things out or factor things out differently. If something is not reused uh, and it's only used once, it's better to kind of, you know, inline emergence, so to speak, so that way it's kind of clear to read only one place. Um, and so, of course, for today's lecture, I've, it's only used in one place but because these slides aren't very big, but you can imagine perhaps there's a way you want to have these things separated out. Or maybe there's places you want to use only mag and not use sign mag. Right? Um, but, yeah, this, 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 this should work. Uh, if we take a look at this code. Oops, I got to make the scrolling on. But, yeah, you can see there's our, you know, fields. Uh, this is the way Chisel happened to decide to collapse the names. Um, but cool. Okay. I'm going to pause here if there's any questions so far. Okay. Um, so with that in mind, uh, let's keep going. Um, so yeah, let's talk about that clone type thing I just mentioned. Uh, I would argue, in my personal opinion, this is probably the ugliest required boilerplate. Um, and it's one of these things where there's, there's no good reason for it other than uh, the Chisel language developers are kind of backed into a corner. <laughs> and for now, this boilerplate is needed and it's been needed for quite a few years. Uh, they were working on trying to remove it. They have some pretty cool workarounds to make it smoother. But for now, it's kind of needed. So basically, what is it? Well, uh, when you make your own bundle and either you parameterize it or extend something, you're probably going to need this, right? Uh, and so what, what, what is this thing you need? Just copy and paste this code. Uh, make sure to replace this with your class, of course, and if there's parameters, you know, put the parameters in there. Um, and, you know, so what's going on kind of under hood? Well, under hood, there is this clone type method, which is normally available in Scala classes. And the way bundle does things, which we extend as well, it kind of inadvertently breaks that. Um, we kind of need help it move along. Um, like I said, future versions of Chisel hopefully will have this uh, removed. But for now, it's just one line uh, in a bundle. And often bundles are much bigger, so it's not so bad. Um, yeah, it, it's kind of annoying. So for example, uh, you know, here we ran it just fine. It's assigned magnitude. In this case, they class them all into one uh, bundle definition. Uh, you know, this is the, the code we expect down here. Oops, I don't know why I can scroll right now. Oops. Uh, but if, for example, were to remove this clone type, it's probably going to growl at me. Yeah, there it growls at me. So, this code would otherwise be completely valid, right? You're like, what the heck did I do wrong, right? This looks like totally valid code. Uh, if it's involving a bundle, consider adding this clone type method. Uh, like I said, so for really simple bundles that don't extend other custom types and don't have any parameters, like I had in the prior slide, which was kind of carefully constructed, it was totally fine. Notice how I had a preset width here. However, if you start having parameters and subclassing other types, extending other types, you probably need this clone type. So yeah, it's annoying boilerplate, but just copy it and get it right and then forget about it. Um, cool. Uh, let's keep going. So there's uh, some more stuff we can do with bundles. Uh, and that is there's uh, the flipped uh, operation and the bolt connection operation. So first we're showing the bolt connection. So here's that sign in mag. Um, and the way I defined it, you know, you have to find that clone type, of course. <laughs> Uh, defined, okay, X is, you know, a uint, uh, S is a bool, and uh, I actually didn't bother putting output or input on these, but at some point you do need to have that. Maybe it's better if I go back a slide to show this uh, particular nuance. Let me go back. Uh, oops. Uh, so, for example, if I didn't um, label this output and I remove this output, it would be mad at me because... It's like, oh, wait, I don't know what direction that is. So I can put, uh, you know, output on this. And that's to make it happy. Uh, or you can even put it uh, at this level, right? So I can remove both of these outputs. And then say, um, all of this is an output. Now, because we have these concise uh, model definitions, we're trying to squeeze into... Um, uh, you know, slides, everything's all going the same direction. There's no requirement within a given bundle that all things go the same direction, right? It can be some in, some out. And that's what we're kind of getting to in this next slide, right? So here we had, we've been bothered defining directions here, but 
uh, when we instantiated them, we did. So we said that's an input, that's an output. Here's that unique, interesting operator. So this thing does is it, it was called a bolt connect. If you have the same bundles, uh, it will uh, connect all the port wires up, right? In particular, in this case, uh, it knows which side is the input and which side is the output. So it does the right thing. Um, and it works, you know, just fine. It's a pass through. I could have easily actually swapped uh, these and it should still work, right? Because it understands looking at these modules, which, which is which, right? So these bolt connects are really helpful. You start getting more complicated, more sophisticated designs, especially if you start having bundle types nested within bundle types. Uh, you can go ahead and connect up them all at once, right? So you can imagine, you know, here's my network link, right? Network link has, you know, an address field, a payload field, a valid field, a, you know, wait field, whatever. Pull those fields into a bundle and just bolt connect them all at once. Cool, so that's the bolt connect operation. Now, I'm um, going to quickly modify the code to show flipped. And so, uh, so for example, uh, if I defined these to be output, this works because this says uh, this is input. But instead, if I you know just had these as sign and magged, uh, I want this to be flipped, right? And so as the name implies, it's going to do the right thing. If I didn't make this flipped, it's probably going to complain that uh, it's output to output, right? So one of them needs to be an input. <laughs> and so flipped is a way to uh, get that behavior. Oops. And I can't spell it right now. Um, great. So uh, this is a very common thing you're going to see where you maybe define some sort of bundle, which you kind of use as like a standard link in your maybe some sort of interface you're using. And yeah, you kind of put it in one place, and you're going to put it someplace else and then call, you know, flipped on it in order to get the reverse direction. Uh, now we can kind of uh, mush them together with the uh, bull connect. Whew. We're getting there. Yeah, so today is kind of a day of all these different ways of how to collect and combine all of your stuff and kind of encapsulate in a way that's kind of more hierarchical and nicer to deal with. Um, so as one last little wrinkle, there's this thing called option in Scala we're kind of to use, right? And so uh, you may have seen this kind of inadvertently, now we can talk about this more formally. <laughs> so what option is, it's a parameterized thing that can indicate that something uh, may not exist, right? So in a lot of languages, uh, you know, as a programmer, we kind of assign like a, a sentinel value to kind of track something that's not there. So we say, oh, you know, you know, for example, is this number negative one to know that it's actually not a real argument? Or, you know, is this pointer null to know there's actually not any data there? So you know what, let's not do that. Let's actually just have a separate way of tracking that. So you have this option type, which either is, it's like a super type, and either is either none or some. And it's something of actually exists, right? And so none, uh, you know, means that there's nothing there. And some means there's something there and here's the value, right? So if some exists, you know, that means uh, that should be a valid value you should do things with. And um, there's a lot of ways to deal with these options. Some of the methods you deal with in Scala will re return an option. Uh, a very basic way to interact with these is to directly call these methods on it. So if you have something you know is an option, you can call dot is defined to return true or false if it exists or is none. And if you know it exists, you can call dot get to get the actual value out of that sum. Right? Uh, and um, otherwise, you're going to uh, get an exception, right? So uh, here's a little example. So we defined an option of type int. And we said it was sum of four, right? If I try to say, you know, O plus two, this is probably gonna be a little grumpy because uh, it's trying to um, add two onto a, well, sum is maybe better for the other way around, right? It's, it's able to figure out a way to add uh, an integer plus a, a, an option, right? Now, here, because it's defined, we get the value, right? If I didn't define this thing, of course, it's going to get none. And, you know, if I, for example, didn't bother to check if it's defined and just tried to, uh, you know, access it, and it was something that was going to work, but that's risky because, of course, if it was uh, nothing, it blows up, right? <laughs> um, but so the reason why this is helpful is there's going to be times where for parameterization, we're going to want to pass around, oops, I didn't mean to go that high. We're going to want to pass around objects, uh, sorry, uh, options. And with options, we're going to be able to um, kind of capture this something existing or not existing. So as you can see right here, uh, we're going to make optional fields in the bundle using uh, an option. So let's go ahead and see that on the next slide. Um, so uh, 
calling this uh, you know bundle type maybe pair, right? So we have a, a bit width, sure. And then there's this Boolean has Y, right? So normally we always get X, but you know, uh, question is what about has Y? So if has Y is true, we get some thing here, right? We wrapped it in some. If this is false, we get none. And then, yeah, because we had enough funky stuff in this bundle, we had to put a clone type in there. Okay, like I said, but plate ignore that. Um, so then what happens inside our module, right? So our module, we're taking this uh, Boolean, if we're gonna use a Y, um, and uh, so we stitch it our IO, we pass that on. And then if we're using a Y, we're gonna go ahead and attach that output, but if not, we're not, right? So uh, if we go ahead and run this, what do we have, right? Well, uh, because initially we said we're using the Y, we're gonna go ahead and you know define 8-bit Y fields, then we're gonna set X and Y both to four. But what's cool is if we say, you know what? We don't want Y. It's like completely gone, right? It's not just pruned by decode elimination. It never even made it to the point to even be pruned, right? Um, and so now already our, our uh, bundle is a pretty cool thing, right? So in the beginning we had you know, these bundles which were you know, very static and anonymous and defined you know, right in our modules in a very rigid kind of like a classic you know, Verilog style interface. And already in the last week, we've kind of seen how to use vex to have an arbitrary number of inputs for some things that are indexed and with today's stuff we now can see how to have optional fields as well as nested fields using other bundles or even extending existing bundles to kind of do things so you can kind of see how very quickly uh these interfaces now kind of become much more parameterizable and constructible things rather than such rigid kind of locked in things uh cool okay uh, i think i only have one more slide yes so uh when I introduced Seek earlier in the week, uh, looking at the lab, I admitted to cover one, one method. Um, so uh, we saw the Seek, but this is something that exists in a lot, which is not just Seeks. We saw use fill as a way to kind of populate collection. You can use fill to say, hey, I want, you know, N, you know, things of this. Um, tabulate something a little bit more general, right? What it does is it says, hey, I want to uh, create N things, and rather than just putting N identical copies of something in there like fill does, and so it says, you know what, I want to call a function to produce those elements, right? And so that function you're calling, uh, we're actually going to have it be uh, an anonymous function, which we're going to cover these in more detail later. But for now, you can kind of see that right here, where it takes in one argument, which is the index, and you do something with it, right? So it's the, the argument, and then this is the kind of syntax that you know it's going to be an anonymous function, and then the result, right? Uh, so if we go ahead and run this out, what do we see? Well, of course, if I say, hey, I want to you know, just fill a seek with four zeros. We saw that before. No problem. Okay, I want to tabulate, so I want four elements. It's going to go from zero to three. And what does my anonymous function do? It just takes i and then returns i. So in other words, the identity. So yeah, so we had the index of zero to three, and we got a list with zero to three. Um, now, uh, as an alternative, like if that's all we really wanted, uh, you could probably uh, do um, this, right? This should work. Oops. Mind you put that in parents. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so that, that, that does work. Um, you'd actually probably be happier if I put it. Uh, so yeah, so, um, so if that's all you wanted, of course you could do simpler, but you can imagine you might have something non-trivial here. It's not just I, or sometimes maybe it is I. Um, but then this last one, Using some interesting uh, syntax, there's this wildcard replacement you can do with underscores. So if you know you have a anonymous function uh, and you're only going to use an argument once, it's going to go ahead and just bind automatically. So it's even more concise syntax. Uh, these uh, you know wildcards are pretty cool. Uh, sometimes they aren't going to work and they're going to do crazy things and blow up in your face. And so you got to use them a little judiciously. But in this case, it's pretty uh, helpful, right? So in this case, we said, hey, for indexes, multiply it by two. So now we get you know. 0246. Um, so that's an example of tabulate. Like I said, this appears in, uh, I think, the labs. Uh, it's kind of helpful way for things like, you know, maybe you want to fill out a large collection before you toss into a, a ROM or to a memory or something. Uh, cool. Okay. That's that. Uh, any last questions? Sure.
Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, the, the question is why they have to use clone type here. Uh, didn't I say it had to be used for parameterized bundles? For parameterized bundles, or in this case, uh, it's not extending bundles, it's extending a subclass of bundle. That's the other wrinkle here. Um, but my advice is if it's a really simple situation where you're extending bundle directly and you don't have any parameters, try it out without clone type. If it growls, just toss a clone type in there. <laughs> Uh, and like I said, hopefully uh, this is something that uh, if you want to watch the most recent Chisel talks, they're, they're ta they're, this has been known for a long time. The reason why it's been far down the list of, feature, of issues is because, you know, often bundles get pretty big and one line clone type bullet play isn't so bad. But yeah, they're trying to get rid of that mixed language even more polished. No problem. Okay, so that, that's, that's all uh, we have prepared for today. Uh, I just want to kind of, you know, close our mind of where we are in this course. So yeah, we've done two weeks. Uh, by now, you should mostly feel pretty empowered to do whatever you could do in Verilog in Chisel for the most part, uh, as well as we're already kind of starting to see some parameterization and kind of constructing these um, bundles as we would like. Assignment-wise, uh, we've already posted uh, Lab 2, which is due uh, next Tuesday, and I should be ready to go on the internal Jupyter system as well as push to the public internet for those who want to try it out there too. Uh, and uh, Homework 2 hopefully posted probably late tonight, early tomorrow, and I'll be due, of course, next week on Thursday. Uh, and you'll have a chance to kind of put these things into practice. And with that, I uh, wish you all a happy Friday and a good weekend.